Good morning. I just want to tell you, uh, this is, as Pastor Jim mentioned, the second time I've been here to bring the word to you, uh, but I've also uh, been here to worship with you a couple times over the years, and, and I have to tell you that it's, uh, you always make me feel so warmly welcome when Emmy and I come here, and, and we leave so richly blessed, and all credit for that goes to y'all, and all glory to the Christ the Lord, the one whom we gather to worship here today. And now may the words of my lips and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. You know, to be perfectly honest with you this morning, I am more than a little bit nervous. You think a pastor would get past that after a while, but I don't think that ever happens. I don't know. I think part of that anxiety, or I know that at least part of that anxiety is, is based in the fact that when we come, but when a pastor comes before you to bring the word of God, they are truly hoping and praying that it is the word of God and that it is what you need to hear on this day. That bit of anxiety is quite probably present within everybody, whoever stands before you preaching. But there are also a couple other reasons for my anxiety here this morning. The first, believe it or not, is that this is Transfiguration Sunday. It's a day in which we are called to remember that moment in which Jesus goes up to the mountain with his apostles, Peter, James, and John. And then suddenly, as we heard in the scripture read to us, Moses and Elijah appear with Jesus. You know, for Peter, James, and John, the appearance of Moses and Elijah is perhaps that confirmation that they need to know that Christ truly has come to fulfill both the law and the prophets. And it is in that moment on that mountaintop when the disciples hear that voice speaking from heaven that says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. And then the voice says, listen to him. Transfiguration Sunday is a remembrance of that particular revelation that, that this itinerant rabbi by the name of Jesus truly is the Son of God. This is one of the most important stories that we have in our Bible, in my mind at least, and yet as important as this story is to our understanding of who Christ is and why he came, he was sent to us, I have to tell you that I'm not going to be speaking about that here today. However, again, I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you today or, or tomorrow at the latest to look once again at those words in Scripture and to remember what they are all about. You can find that story three places in the Gospel, in Matthew chapter 17, or in Mark chapter 9, what we heard this morning, or in Luke chapter 9. And then my final bit of anxiety, you're going to think I'm a nervous wreck before I get out of here, right? some kind of basket case. But my final bit of anxiety is that part of my message to you this morning is going to be very personal. It's going to reveal some of the spiritual struggles that I have had in years past, and, and i got to be honest, that's not an easy thing for me to do. It is, however, something I have felt led to do this morning. All right, that's a whole lot of introduction, but let me begin this morning by asking you about words. I just want you to think about words, because words are powerful, are they not? Words are powerful. We've all heard that, that old children's nursery rhyme, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words, what, can never hurt me, right? I mean, does anybody really believe that? Words are powerful. Words carry tremendous force and, and depth and tremendous meaning. We have all been witness to, and I think in most cases, we have, we have borne the brunt, the, the heaviness, the weightiness of words. We all know that words can build us up or they can tear us down. Words can lead us to a time of war and conflict, or they can lead us to a season of peace and prosperity. And one of the lessons that I have learned over my years is that 
you know, the size of the word has very little to do with its power. Think about two words that we use every day, many times every day, the simple words yes and no. How much power is contained within those words? I got to tell you, Emmy waved to everybody. Emmy waved. She's shy. <laughs> My wife. We've been married for just over 45 years, but I can so very clearly remember the evening that I proposed to her. I can visualize exactly where we were. I could tell you everything that was taking place around us. I can still hear every sound that was happening in the vicinity around us. I can still feel my heart beating, seemingly ready to burst through flesh and bone. Will you marry me? How much power was contained in her two possible answers, yes or no? Now, i got to be honest with you, I thought she was going to say yes, but what if I was wrong? In our case, I knew I would be taking her away from her family. I would even be taking her out of her culture. And what if she wasn't willing to make that sacrifice? Well, thankfully, she said yes. And it has been a yes that has had a lot of ups and downs over these past four and a half decades. And yet there was so much power in that three-letter word yes that my wife gave to me. And it strikes me that the many words in the Bible are exactly like that. Rather insignificant words when standing by themselves are, are oftentimes so powerful in the context in which they are presented. Words, you know, we use all the time here in church and hopefully outside of church. Words like love or grace, peace, joy, hope. Now, I do want to interject here that I believe every word in our scripture has been, has been inspired by God. So words like reconciliation and redemption, words like justification and atonement, all those big fancy 50 cent words, every word is significant. But my focus with you this morning is on those little words we just seem to pass right by. Those words we tend to overlook as perhaps unimportant or even meaningless. Words we hardly even notice. Now for our scripture this morning, I'm going to be reading from the New International Version, and I know that's not the translation that you typically use here at Trinity. In fact, I'm going to be using the original version of the NIV, which was in night, copyrighted in 1973, but I'm going to be using that one only because when I first learned the words that I want to share with you, and when these words first touched my heart and changed my life, I heard them and I learned the importance of them from this particular translation. I'm going to be reading to you from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5 and verses 1 through 8. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope and the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. May God add his blessing and his understanding to the reading of our word. Now, 
for the second time already, I need to apologize to you because I feel like I'm shortchanging you a bit here today. I already told you that I was not going to be speaking about the Mark passage, about the transfiguration, even though that would be very appropriate to do so on this day. And now I have to tell you that I'm only going to be speaking very, very, very briefly on the first five verses from the fifth chapter of Romans that I just shared with you. Honestly, I think there have to be three or maybe even four sermons in those five short verses, but I simply do not have time to expound on all, well, maybe I do. How long y'all want to hang around? <laughs> but I need to talk a little bit about them because I want you, it's important for us to see exactly what Paul is doing in this passage of Scripture. Paul, and I have to tell you that Paul is one of those persons from our Bible that one of these days I'm going to corner him in heaven and, and kind of trap him in and just have this really deep conversation with him about so many things that he wrote, so many questions that I have. Because to me, Paul really has a great way of of, he's like a fisherman. He has this great way of getting us to nibble at his bait before he snags us on the line. And I don't say that in a negative sort of way at all. But look at what Paul does in Romans 5. He writes, since you have been justified through faith. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Wait. I've read the Bible I read the New Testament as well as the Old Testament, you know, and what about the law, Paul? What about all, all the sacrifices that I need to make before I am acceptable to God, you know? Uh, what about all the dirt that is in my life? And then Paul goes on to write, he says, peace with God. Uh, I understand having the peace of God in my life, but peace with God. You know, for as long as I can remember, I've always been taught that sin is abhorrent to God, and I still believe that to be true. I've heard it said that God, in his perfect and holy righteousness, cannot even bear to look upon sin. So, so until, Paul, until I get all of my stuff together... Until I can truly say that I am living a holy life, how can I have peace with God? See, Paul, this, this just doesn't make sense. And maybe, maybe it doesn't make sense because we are unable to comprehend what unconditional love truly is. That's the hook that Paul is use, using to prepare to snag us on his line. Maybe the love that God has for me is so much different than any love I have been, ever been able to live out in my own life that I simply can't understand it. And I really do believe that is the crux of the matter. Author Douglas Cooper once wrote, he wrote these words. I want you to listen closely to this. Douglas Cooper said, the average person is programmed from birth to love only conditionally. Think about that for a moment. I think we are all raised, are we not, with the idea that we must, what, we must please our parents or we must please our friends in order to receive their love. And then we just naturally start to expect our, our friends to, to try to please us if they want our love in return. See, that's why it's so difficult for us to love someone who has beliefs or, or understandings that are different from ours, right? That's why it's so difficult for us to love someone who acts differently from the, the way we think they should or who lives their life in opposition to what we believe is good and true. See, as human beings, our concept of love is very conditional. So when God says, you know, God says, I love you, what naturally pops into our minds? We think, well... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that sounds good, but no way, God. 
I mean, God can't love me because there are just too many flaws in my life. There are too many shortcomings. Instead, what do we do? Instead, we think, you know, I need to please God first, and then he will love me. And we live that out. We try to keep the Ten Commandments. We try to be generous in our giving to others. We try not to, we, here we go, we try not to scream at that driver who just cut us off in traffic, right? We try not to shout obscenities at someone who is on the other side of a debate or an argument with us. We try not to resort to Twitter to de degrade someone. Subconsciously, we believe that when we do everything right, we will please God, and then God will be able to love us. Now, I understand we all know the book answer, right? Someone asks us, does God really love me? And we re we're quick to respond. We say, well, of course he does. God loves everyone. But do we really? Let me change that. In the depth of my soul, do I really believe that God loves me? Every time you're in a position where you say to yourself, I I can't believe that I lost my temper once again. Or every time you wonder why you can't get past that one sin that continues to plague you after all these years as a Christian, or every time you once again experience shame or guilt because you know that you failed to be a faithful witness of Jesus Christ, do you really, in that moment, do you really believe that God loves you? I think one of the reasons why I landed on this topic and on this scripture passage for this morning is that this is the Sunday before Ash Wednesday. We're about to enter into that season of Lent, you know, and, and I don't know about you, but for me, Lent is a time of deep introspection. I hope that's true for you as well. In fact, I want to encourage you, I want to take a moment out here and encourage you to spend time in your Bible each and every day over these next seven weeks. Even if you're one who has never done that before, even if you're that person who says, you know, I just don't have time for that sort of thing, Pastor, I want you to try to make the time. Can you give God just 10 minutes a day? Read your Bible. If you don't know where to read, then, then go pick up a Lenten devotional book somewhere to guide you through that. Or ask Pastor Jim for recommendations on what you should read. But let this season of Lent be a season when you give God some, some real time, some real consideration. Listen, not so you can please God, okay? Not so you can please God, but so that he can reveal himself to you. Anyway, some number of years ago, I was struggling spiritually. Everything else in life was grand, but I was struggling spiritually. I felt, I, I believed that God was calling me into vocational ministry, was calling me to be a pastor, Initially, I knew it had to be acid indigestion or something like that. Because life was good. I was working in a job that I absolutely loved. I was surrounded at work by people that were absolutely wonderful. Life was good. I could honestly say that I didn't have a care in the world except for this, that annoyance, that uneasiness was there. It wouldn't let me alone, and I didn't know what to do with it. I spoke with my pastor. I spoke with some trusted Christian friends. They all confirmed that they believed ministry was the direction I needed to go. And I want you to know this was not some short-lived thing. This went on for several years. I found that 
whenever I would encounter a second career pastor, I, I pity them now when I think back on it, but I'd corner them somewhere and try to pick his or her brain, asking questions like, well, how did you know for sure? How'd you know for sure that God was calling you into ministry? What, what was it that convinced you to take that final step? But the real question that I kept asking myself was, with all the mistakes I've made in my life, why would God want me? With all the character flaws that I knew I still had within me, I could never be a pastor. With all the things that still needed to be changed in me. I was in a rather small worship gathering one evening. We had come together in a time of worship and prayer to lift up some Christian brothers who were on a spiritual retreat weekend. It was one of those very contemplative, one of those very intimate sort of settings. And I was listening intently to the pastor who was leading us through a time of worship and prayer. And he was expounding on a passage from Luke chapter 24 that takes place soon after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this story, but Jesus, where Jesus is walking along that road to Emmaus, he's with two men who don't recognize him. But those two men are sharing with Jesus their deep grief and sorrow on how the one they thought was the Messiah had been crucified three days earlier. Well, after walking for several miles, they decide to stop for the evening, and they end up sharing in dinner together. And at the end of the meal, Jesus takes the bread, and he breaks it, and it gives some to each one of them. And in that very moment, Luke writes, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And I remember sitting there in the quiet of that moment. I remember uttering a silent prayer, praying that in this moment, my eyes would be opened. And that I would finally, after all these years of trying and failing, to be that good Christian. After all these years of trying and failing to please God, I prayed that I truly would recognize Christ in my own life. Well, the pastor leading our small group worship then led us into a time of sharing in the sacrament of Holy Communion. And, and as part of that, preparatory to that, he read words from Romans chapter 5. And he read, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he read the words, God's love has been poured out into our hearts. And then he read the words, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. And then he read, but, he read, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I have to tell you that as often as I heard that passage before, as often as I had read that passage, I don't think I ever heard the words but and yet before. Two rather small, insignificant words that just slammed into my heart, reverberated in my head. I mean, the words for Scripture, as I thought about them, were pretty clear. If I was a righteous person, it would still be a very rare occasion for someone to die for me. If I was a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But, but God. 
while I was yet, while I was still a sinner. See, folks, that's unconditional love. That's the unconditional love we always talk about. That's the unconditional love that we have such a hard time understanding. That's the proof that so many of us are seeking. God demonstrates. God shows. God proves. No matter what the world might do for a righteous person, no matter what the world might or might not do for a good person, but God demonstrates, while I was yet a sinner. Folks, is it good for you to know that regardless of what kind of rags you might be wearing, God has already proven how much he loves you? Is it good to know that regardless of those, those dark recesses in your heart or those unspoken secrets in your heart, in spite of the malice and the unthoughtfulness you may have offered to others, in spite of the jealousy or the resentment or the petty grievances that taint your love for others, God has already proven how much he loves you. See, when we can begin to grasp the importance of these words, untold opportunities arise. When we accept these words as God's holy and inspired truth, innumerable doors open up for us. Life becomes less of a trial in which we need to prove ourselves and more of a promise into which we live. All because there are no strings attached. There are no prerequisites. There is no entrance exam to the love of God that we receive through our faith in Jesus Christ. I want you to understand this message I'm sharing with you this morning. is It's not about doing whatever we please in life. This message is not about some sort of cheap grace, you know, where we just kind of wallow in our self-gratification and and we think that, you know, no matter what I do, God's got it all covered. Rather, this message is about the enormous price that God paid so that in spite of our fallenness, in spite of our brokenness, we can know beyond the shadow of a doubt that God loves us. And it is as we respond to his love that, and that we seek to become more like Christ, not out of guilt, not out of shame, not to please God, not so we can earn his love, but we do it as our response to him out of our love for him. David Cassidy, who people my age will remember as the lead singer of the Partridge family, Well, he died this past year, 2017. His final words, as recorded by his daughter, from whom he had been separated for most of her life, were these. He said to his daughter, so much wasted time. And those words made me think about how much, how much of our lives might be wasted, in a sense, because we don't quite understand who we are to God. And in that, we never quite get to all that God desires for us to be. Instead, we go through life, we spend time carrying a burden of guilt and shame and, and failure that God never intended for us to shoulder. My wife is a huge Blue Bloods TV show fan, so I've seen every episode, I don't know how many times. But Tom Selleck's granddaughter, Nikki, in one episode was lamenting a college roommate who had attempted suicide because of her failures, her personal failures. And Nikki visited her friend in the hospital as she was recovering from the suicide attempt, and she asked her friend why she would do that 
rather than just coming and speaking to Nikki about it. And the roommate replied that she was ashamed to share her failures with Nikki, to which Nikki responded, I'm your friend. You don't need to be perfect. You only need to believe in the one who believes in you. You know, this season of Lent that lies before us, it truly is a time for deep personal examination. It is a time for intense introspection. But it is not a time for guilt or shame or self-deprecation. It is a time for us to listen to the words spoken from the cloud to Peter, James, and John. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. It's not a time for us to check on how well we are pleasing God. But it is a time for us to reflect on how we are responding to the unconditional love already given to us while we were yet sinners. So my prayer for you in these coming weeks is that you might allow Christ to speak into your hearts so that you might be set free from all the chains, all the anchors that bind you. And remember, you don't need to be perfect, but you have to believe in the one who yet believes in you. Would you please pray with me? Holy Father and Lord of all, we come to you as fragile vessels, chipped and broken, cracked and crushed. We come as those who are far from perfect, and yet we come as those who have faith in your good promises. You have called us. You have welcomed us. You willingly gave up your only son so that we might know the depth of your unconditional love. And it is through him that we not only have life, but we have life to the full. Lord, may we never lose sight of the gift of love we have received, a gift we can never earn. And in our response, may we never stop seeking to be more like you. In the precious name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray. Amen.